Um, I'm going to provide opportunity for questions a little bit later after Andre's presentation um, uh, so that uh, we can uh, do the questions on both of the presentations. One of the important aspects, one of the many important aspects that uh, Duat showed us is that the whole question about integrating a solution so that you are able to actually respond to whatever happens. Now, we showed clearly that we need to be able to detect the things that happen, but we also need to make sense of what we detect, and we need to be able to respond to that. Um, it doesn't help us to be able to detect what's going on without the ability to respond to that. But similarly, it doesn't, we won't be able to respond if we didn't detect the threat. And the system or the, the technology that Andre is going to present to us now um, is a system that will enable us to detect threats that are happening. It now and again happens that uh, even though we try to uh, use sensors that you get off the shelf, it happens that there are certain situations where you don't get a sensor like that. And that was exactly the case when we had to um, do surveillance of areas of several kilometers, square kilometers within the Kruger Park. And at that stage, we had to develop a system that enabled us to do that. So Andre is going to tell us a little bit about this. Um, it's a demonstrated talk uh, with the title From Wildlife Surveillance to Critical Infrastructure Protection. And then they call it a world-class situational awareness system. So Andre is currently the radar business development manager. He started off his career at the CSIR in 1995 as a radar system modeler and a systems engineer. And uh, since then, at uh, 2010, he, became, he started managing the whole radar group. He led a number of CSIR teams working with industry on joint programs to develop products as well as to make impact in user communities. And that includes, for instance, the RSR 940 radar that was installed on the South African naval frigates. Uh, he led the conceptualization phase of the Meerkat Wide Area Surveillance System successfully deployed in the Kruger National Park to counter rhino poaching. Andre, if you can tell us a little bit more about that system, please. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Dwight, also for the, the presentation and the context. As the, both gentlemen have mentioned, this is sort of homing into a specific solution in the, in the larger context that um, Dwight was presenting. Um, the goal here is just to sh sort of show some of the work that we are doing to move away from the success that we've had in the Kruger Park um, and start uh, um, realizing a system that can also be used broader as well, but also an, uh, so even an improved system in the Kruger environment. Um, sorry, where's that? Uh, sorry. Thank you. There we go. Um, so in order to do that, I'm first going to utilize the Meerkat as to showcase some of the things and some of the concepts behind it. Um, the area that we in traditionally lost at its worst two to three rhinos a day. Um, there was a lot of reaction, there was a lot of focus on the area, there were various teams deployed and multiple reports of, of poaching incidents. And we've brought that down now to less than one rhino in the period of 12 months. So in our, our high peak periods or in times when we know that there is going to be a lot of poaching or incursions, usually before or after the onset of full moon, we have teams that are prepared and that are waiting um, in order to react to that. Previously, you know, you'd have to have people out there 24 hours a day, which just isn't possible. Um, it's also enabled us to carry out our work a lot safer. So before you even go out into the bush, you have an idea with a system like the Meerkat of who you're following, how many people you're following, um, often what are they carrying. You get an idea of the terrain that they are. Um, over time, looking at the records and the data um, and collecting all that evidence, you start to pick up trends. So you can start to anticipate, so they've come in here, they're moving here, they're possibly going to go out there, let's go and intercept them. Through rigorous trial and error and an iterative approach, um, many solutions were tested in areas that uh, Peace Parks supports to an end where we come up with 
solutions that work best in different environments. Among those solutions was the Wide Area Surveillance System. It combines the persistent all-weather, day and night capabilities of a ground surveillance system as a primary sensor with the capabilities of an optronic sensor to classify these threats and also to enrich the information that the radar gave us. In the area where the postcode Merco was deployed, an incredible 95% of the incursions from poachers were detected. And of those, 65% uh, were arrested. And if they weren't arrested, an incredible 80% of them were disrupted. I think the impact that it had, not only on the poaching, but on the morale of the rangers, mustn't be underestimated. So previously you would walk a detection zone in the morning, the rangers would pick up a track, they'd put the dog on the track, and then they'd follow that track. And you don't know for how long you're going to follow. Often the incursions were 30 kilometers into the park. So you track until you either caught the poachers, had a contact, you hopefully successfully caught all of them, or you caught one, or they got away. Um, or you tracked until it was too dark and you simply just couldn't carry on. Um, with systems like the Meerkat, where you effectively know where your target is beforehand, so instead of picking up the spoor on the field and going 30 kilometers in, you now have an actual starting point. Speaking to rangers and often we sit and get around and sort of do our needs analysis and try and figure out how we're going to make things work. Um, I think what's always comes out really strongly is that we're always really encouraged and touched by people that sometimes don't have any connection to Kruger and certainly don't know us, but put their faith and their funding in us and our projects um, through organisations like Peace Park. So we certainly wouldn't be able to do what we are doing if it weren't for the various donors and funders out there. Right, so that gives a, a bit of context, um, much quicker than me trying to show you through, take you through it in a lot of detail. So as was mentioned, the system utilizes a radar. And the big strength of radar is utilizing what's called the Doppler effect. Um, we can separate energy from, so the radar it sends out energy, ref, energy reflects off everything in the environment, and we can separate the energy which is moving from anything that's moving from anything else that's standing still, okay? And I'm gonna show you how that allows us to, to create a concept of what we call an area defense. We no longer have to just put a fence and when people cross the fence, you can sort of put some kind of a smart sensor there that, that um, will pick them up. But by the time the guys have got there, that person's walked a couple of kilometers into the Kruger Park. We're talking about vast areas that we're trying to detect over here. Um, Radar is particularly good at picking those things up, but the problem is what, what we still don't know exactly what it is, and that's where we put a long-range electro-optical sensor onto the system so that once the, the, the movement is picked up, we can interrogate it with the electro-optical system. I keep forgetting I've got a button here. Um, so this is a typical Meerkat deployment. You can see um, it's put on a high site, and then it overlooks the area in front of you. Um, looking out um, quite a number of kilometers out into the field, just to give you an idea, I think that there is about one or two kilometers away. So the distance that the system is looking is well beyond that. Um, the, so this is the, the operator display of the Meerkat system, and it gives you a bird's eye view of anything that moves. Okay, just have to get this mouse sensor across here. So what happens over here is this radar sweeps the area in front here every in the region of 15 seconds. And um, as it goes across, anything that moves, it puts a red dot like that. There's a red dot over there to say something was moving at that point over there. And 12 seconds later, it comes across again and um, Anything that was red, it makes dark blue, and then it fades it over time, so you can see the tracks. Sorry, I actually wanted to say one specific thing over here. Um, and that was that when this whole project started, 
as this, the video showed, it was a big crisis. So we really worked on getting something into the field as quickly as possible. We did not work on automation at all. And I'm going to show you just now what we are doing on automation. Um, so get in there and make a difference. And I think we managed to help, help them to make a difference. There's no way that I'm saying that the meerkat solved the problem. It's just part of a much bigger integrated system. Okay. Um, the other big thing is that, as I think Duarte uh, alluded to a lot, um, it's a whole system that needs to be put there. So we had to work very closely with the user to optimize it for real operations. So there's not just a bit of kit there, but the whole system gets integrated with the way they operate with the system as well. Um, so if I play this video quickly. Um, so this is going to show it's a sped up video. Sorry about this. Seems to have lost the mouse, there we go. I think this is a two hand job. I'm actually just going to drag it. It's much quicker. You can see how things develop over here. And you can see how over this whole region over here, I mean, these are kilometers over here, you're starting to see everything that moves. And it's obviously a combination of many things, many animals, many people. Um, every time there is something of interest, then the, um, the operator is able to indicate that on the map and use that optics to try and see what, what is actually moving there in the day and night. And then the system puts a little ring on the thing to indicate, well, that's a, either a, um, if the operator indicates it to be an animal and it puts a little green ring, and if it in indicates it to be orange or a person, then it puts a little orange ring. So he's got that history for himself, okay? So this is actually the context of a real poaching incident. There were two poaching teams entering the Kruger National Park one there and one along there. Um, and you can see how they develop over time. Um, and it really gives the rangers the opportunity to, um, here you can see how it develops over time. The two poaching teams entered like this, were intercepted by the rangers over here. You can see how the system also provides you the ability to sort of even control during the, the reaction um, phase of the mission to even be able to give you an indication and control your own forces in such a situation. Um, so, yeah, so I think this very clearly indicates the advantage of, the advantage of such a system. Um, the, obviously the big thing that we have at this stage over here, it's still, all the radar is able to do is able to um, localize and it does it very well um, and this is how it is used to to in the counter approaching environment okay what I'm going to go into now is what we're doing now so we got funding from the DSI after seeing the success of the Kruger of the of the, of the Meerkite system to develop a next generation radar. And um, this is what I'm gonna present. So we've been working for the last 20 years on doing the automat automated classification, classification techniques for various, um, for various targets. You can see how we use the different Doppler spectrums of different aircraft to be able to classify them. Um, we at the pace stage where we can classify the make and model of a helicopter, for example. Um, we can also create these images, which don't look anything nearly as good as the optical image, but consider this is, can be day, done in day, night, through clouds, and at much longer ranges than we can do with the optical system. Um, and similar to in boat classification. So we've, we, we've had a program looking at that for about um, 12 years, from about 2000 to 2012, 13. 
and at these various techniques, really focusing on maritime domain awareness. And then we started having a look at the, at the Kruger problem. So we shifted our focus to the land case where, where we need to see the difference between people and animals. Okay. The other big input into this, into this um, development is the development of phased array technology. We've developed the first phased array radars in South Africa. And these are various radars which we are been developing with that. Just quickly to tell you what is phased array. Phased array is a, te is a technique. It's um, been used for quite a while in the developed countries. It's quite expensive technology, but we found that of late, um, we've come up with rather cheap designs for this phased array technology using um, the, te the components which have been developed for the cell phone market. Um, so a traditional radar, um, you can see swings its beam by swinging the antenna, and that's what the Meerkat does. So you can see at any instant, it takes time to move it from one point to the other. It also takes a certain amount of time to do a detection. So you can't go faster than a certain speed, otherwise you won't be able to do a good enough detection. And when you're trying to do classification, you actually have to do an order or two magnitude longer dwell or look at it for longer in order to classify with radar signal. So that's why it starts becoming a bit of a problem. So with phased array, it gives you the flexibility to, as illustrated over here, move the beam without actually moving the face of the radar. Okay? And this just shows it in the, sim in the similar way that it's done over here, but on, it gives you the ability to say in one millisecond look in one direction and in one millisecond look in a different direction. Okay? And that's at the heart of the technology. Um, on top of that, we've used our classification capability and now looked at it at, um, looked at the, um, the use the classification capability on walking people. And this is what's called a spectrogram of a walking person. You can see this is velocity in this direction measured with Doppler. And as they walk, you see these various um, spectral lines and things like that caused by swinging arms and swinging legs. And that is fed into a neural network in order to do the classification. We used various um, sort of techniques using this, using this um, array technology. This is a technique that is on our, on our current system that transmits on a very broad beam so that we can um, um, in, um, simultaneously detect in a lot of de directions in the same time, allowing us to do that thing of dwelling long enough in order to be able to classify. Okay. Um, so let me rather, this is a demonstrator talk, let me rather show you what it is able to do. Okay. Um, this is some experiments we did in the beginning of 2021 and down in the Kruger, Kruger National Park and again, system sitting on a mountain. At that stage, our processing capability, we could look in one direction and classify all of that in that direction. Um, so it can only classify in one, in one direction at a time. Um, but you can see it's already starting to sit here. You can, this over here, by the way, is a river. Um, that there is a road. Um, at that stage, there wasn't a classification class for cars. So the cars are seen as unclassified. Um, these are all classified as animals. And also, interestingly, um, trees that are blowing in the wind, which are close to the river over there, are also classified as vegetation. And this is really getting to the point where that can be used to start making an automated system that doesn't need the operator behind the system in order to be able to continuously look at the system. The operator rather starts becoming a manager of the system that the system can flag them when there, when there is a, a high priority target in a region that shouldn't be there. So let me just play this video as well. You'll see that shortly after this, we swing the classification zone processing zone to this area and we have a person that's walking over there and how the system is able to classify that person so you just time along the head of it Okay, so previous, previously there were just dots and dots indicated location, um, the, the position. 
Now every one of those dots is given a color. Um, the green behind them isn't an animal, it's just the GPS tracked, so we use that as ground truth. It's not a lion chasing the person. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is really, it's, it's, it's sort of not much more than the other one, but that ability to now give a color to every single dot is significant change in the capability of the system, okay? Um, and it really allows you to change the way that the system can be used. Now, since then, we've been doing further research on the system. Um, and what's really been, there's been a huge advance in processing hardware. I mean, you're getting AI chips coming out, like you used to get with the graphics processors. Um, they, everything used to be done in your CPU, and then everything, they brought out dedicated graphics processors to do all the graphics processing, and that's why we can get the animation we can get today. Now they're bringing out chips which can do all those neural network analysis almost instant instantaneously. So based on that, we are now with a combination of this array technology and with these things able to get to a point where we can start saying, well, um, it's not so, maybe just one step back. One could put these classification techniques into an old system, okay? Like that, array, that, that scanning system, okay? But then you're gonna have to use your classification in the same way that the camera was doing it. So you would scan, and then at some point you're gonna say, okay, I want to see that for longer. So you have to stop and stare for a little while, and you interrupt your scanning capability, right? And then you're only really gonna classify that specific point now. What we have now is something that actually, as part of your detection process, the, the idea of you no longer have to say, well, let's first see what is, where something is, and then we'll make a choice of those things which are out there, what are we going to classify? Now we can actually be classifying as part of the detection process and filtering things very quickly. And that stage, that way, get rid of a whole lot of the noise and get a much richer picture. And another big thing about this kind of, um, this kind of application is you really need to get the false alarms down. Because as soon as you have too many false alarms, you get operator of fatigue, you get, and people just end up switching things off because they can't afford to be keep, keep going on a wild goose chase. So this is why this is very important. You really have to get that classification capability very high. So what this is interestingly showing is this is the energy from just one of those cells or dots out there over time, over a longer period of time, okay? So what we're able to do is analyze that and even places where there are two different things in that cell at the same time, so maybe a bird crossing over a walking person, you can see how we're able to, so this is now separated in velocity, we can tell, well, this energy comes from a person and that energy comes from a bird. So the level of classification we can do is increasing significantly, okay? Um, so these are all the value propositions um, of our new system. It's got a much higher update rate um, I'm not going to go through all of it. So there, there's the traditional target classification, but I've just spoken to you about how we're not just doing classification as a step down the line. We are now classifying in order to be able to detect better and to track things better. Okay. Um, the... This radar that we have there was really built as a technology demonstrator as a, and, as a, and as a facility that we can take out in the field and actually also do operational experiments with this kind of capability. And it's really shown to be um, successful. Since then, we've developed new generation technology and we now, this is an integrated radar that we're flying on an aircraft, but that same radar over there is allowing us to be able to make a much more integrated and compact radar than we had on, on, the, on the system over there. Um, so this starts allowing us to do things like putting this against buildings and um, looking in a specific zone and having no moving parts, so maintenance is much lower. Um, so, and as you can see, it's scalable technology, so we make different sizes depending on the specific um, requirement in a specific scenario. Okay? And this really will start opening the, the capability for us to utilize it in a lot of different um, security kind of applications. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much, Andre.
We've reached the end of the session, actually, but I believe that uh, Andre and Duarte will still be available to answer some questions if you are still available to ask those questions. So I'm going to open up the floor if there are any questions on uh, any of the two presentations mm -hmm. that were made. So uh, questions, please. Yes. You're welcome. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for the great talk. My name is Kashane from TrackScan. Uh, we deal mainly with security companies on biometric uh, time and attendance. So I just wanted to find out from you, with regards to transport infrastructure, what uh, trends are you seeing when it comes to surveillance of transportation infrastructure and mainly rail infrastructure? I can take that question. So um, uh, one of the things that we're seeing, um, uh, and I'm not sure whether you're asking from the threat perspective or in terms of the countermeasures, uh, the security measures, um, maybe you want to, is there a specific area you'd like me to focus on? Well, more from obviously surveillance. Uh, because oh, oh, yes, right. You said surveillance. Yes. So um, one of the trends there is uh, the use of um, uh, drones uh, with small surveillance teams uh, actually uh, doing the length of the pipeline. Um, we know of um, those kinds of companies that are offering that as a service. Um, so that's one of the major trends in that area. Um, and that is then used to um, uh, uh, initiate a response. So typically um, on a long uh, piece of infrastructure, um, a line infrastructure, you would have um, vehicles, uh, you know, response teams allocated um, to that. But that gets triggered by a, um, a drone surveillance team. So um, there are a number of companies, uh, you know, that own line infrastructure that are using these kinds of services. So that's the one thing. Um, there's also some other important trends in terms of um, um, actually being able to track those drones and you know, integrate the information that's coming out. So those are the new emerging trends in that area. Um, there's, um, yeah, I think, let me leave it there because um, mm -hmm. this is an open forum and I don't want to get into a lot of um, sensitive um, stuff. Um, Just to add to what Duarte said, a lot of people think that you can't use drones because they can't fly for several hours uh, uh, at one time, but they forget about the fact that you can have more than one drone that can take over from each other. So you can actually have ubiquitous um, surveillance with drones as well. Any other questions? The lady there. How can we assist uh, SAPS, well, especially the crime scene uh, experts, if they have to attend to scenes uh, in areas like Kruger National Park, where it's vast and they have to walk kilometers, uh, taking into consideration that uh, they are measured on uh, their response time from a scene, from one scene to the next. I know uh, attending scenes for them at Kruger National Park is uh, quite a challenge. So um, how can you assist uh, the SAPS? And has, have you ever had maybe talks with the SAPS regarding this? Uh, I think it will be interesting for them to know about this, to assist them make sure. Well, well, I actually think you probably better, um, better position to give an integrated view on that. I don't know if you want to take that question. Yeah, I didn't clearly hear the question, though. Um, so uh, maybe one of my colleagues can just yeah. help you um, there. Uh, look, um, we haven't been approached specifically on um, response to scenes, um, you know, and the forensic aspects of that. Um, that hasn't been an area that we've worked on. Um, so perhaps we could just engage after this mm -hmm. to, to discuss um, exactly what you have in mind. Um, th there has been, you know... Um, some questions that have come around um, other types of crime scenes other than the Kruger Park where we um, do have some, some plans, for example, um, in a counter drone. But in the Kruger Park, yes, we are aware of um, the vast distance and, and there's quite a problem in terms of responding properly to that. Mm. Um, but um, it's not an area that I am aware of that the CSR has been involved in. 
I do, though, think that one of the important aspects is knowing exactly where your um, response teams are so that you can dispatch dispatch the team that is nearest to the place where you want to where you want to go and investigate the, the situation. So that might help you to be able to uh, respond faster. That side. Freddy Mukheri from Fabchem. Um, quick question. How much does a basic system actually cost? And is it available to the public or are we talking military technology here? And also, are there any patents associated with this technology? Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, we, we in terms of that system that's in the Kruger National Park, I mean, it is covering a very vast area. So it's, you've got to weigh it up in terms of cost per square kilometer and you need scaled solutions for, for closer range systems. So that system in itself, um, the sensing system there is in the region of 10 million for a system. Okay, so then it's um, covering more than 10 kilometers range kind of thing in order to do that. Um, those systems that we are building, we are really specifically focusing on getting them cheaper, um, close to an order of magnitude cheaper. Um, but that's that's well, that's what we're working on now. In terms of IP and patents, I mean it's it's developed. It is um, developed by us. Um, but our role is not to eventually make that into a product. We put the the system into the Kruger Park as a sort of a bespoke technology demonstrator, it op operates as a technology demonstrator, but it's in an operational environment. Um, and we did the work to do that because of the crisis. Okay. But in terms of going forward and making this available pervasively, our role is much more to develop the technology and then partner with industry to take it to the market, both production and support <coughs> industry and the services industry to do that. Okay. So we're very open to discuss that with anyone who wants to do that with us and take things to market. Okay. Just to add to what Andre said, if he says vast areas, he really mean vast areas because the Meerkat is able to do surveillance of an area of more than 100 square kilometers. So that is really a vast area. Any other questions? You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to find out, you, you're talking about the prevention of uh, Rhino poaching, uh, but also and one of the issues with, with Kruger National Park is the illegal entry into South Africa from Mozambique. And I'm talking from experience because I live next to Kruger National Park. So I wanted to find out, are you also addressing that issue? Because every day you've got people crossing the park into South Africa illegally. So we are able to address that issue, but that was not what we were contracted for. We were contracted to detect poachers in the park. So the technology exists and we can do that. We don't do the response though. So the park does the response and the park is there to catch poachers, not to catch uh, people intruding from different countries. You're welcome. But you, I mean, you did see on the last slide, I mean, we are engaging with um, border management agency and um, people who are responsible for that in terms of how to utilize this technology in those scenarios as well. Absolutely. You're welcome. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for good presentations. Um, mine is on the first presentation about, um, I think um, on the presentation you mentioned that culture is one of the propositions that can actually solve security, um, given the example that you gave about how parliament um, uh, fire happened. Um, but then there is this um, culture of bribery in our justice system, and it's one of the threats that we can actually just assess easily. So what, what are some of the, the solutions that we can actually um, provide to our justice system to, to the issue of culture? Because culture is a soft thing. We can't really um, uh, come up with a system, uh, a technological system to actually um, uh, combat that, 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 that type of issue. And um, another thing that I just wanted to, 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 to bring to your attention is on the SAPS, um, we understand that they actually are supposed to always be open. 
and there is this threat or risk these days that they get to be um, intruded and some of their firearms be stolen in, in the police station. And I think I was listening to radio one of these days in the, during the weekend, one police station decided to actually close their gates, um, lock them so that whoever comes, they have to assess that. So what are some of the solutions in, in that area that you can actually provide things? Okay, um, so let me deal with your first question. Um, as I understood it, um, you're asking, you know, what are the um, interventions around corruption? Uh, oh, just closer. Okay, so um, I want to go through a, a number of them. So um, if you've been following, um, so let's start at a national level. Um, so with the publication of the Zonda Commission, I think that was the first important step, um, you'll see that the um, NPA, or the ID, the, um, is it the uh, Investigative Director, I forget now what that um, stands for, but there's a new unit that's been formed which is investigating. Um, so there's a number of measures to prosecute and um, recover um, um, funds that have been um, Acquired illegally. So that's the first measure. I think that's a really important measure and it sends the right kinds of signals um, to society because the current state of um, uh, a lack of law and order is because of the example that's being set by, um, you know, um, the, the, the party, the, the governing party. Um, so I think this is an important step to actually move into a um, situation where from a governance point of view, we're focusing on national security and not regime protection. So um, we had a very good panel discussion where we discussed this yesterday. But um, then we go into the next level. Um, so one of the things that we have in place for um, uh, employees um, in an organization that relates to critical infrastructure is the whole process of vetting. So um, that's a formal process that's typically conducted by SSA or crime intelligence, um, depending. So that's the next level. Um, we are now working in terms of our security operational concept, um, uh, and I didn't get into this, but we are looking at um, monitoring employees, depending on um, the nature of risk. So you'll recall that um, I started off with um, the threat risk analysis. So the corruption, fraud, um, those are some of the types of risks. There are other types of risks also within an organization like the disgruntled employee um, or um, a, uh, you know, somebody that's got a particular um, issue with a family member working at an organization. Um, so that kind of thing, um, so depending on exactly what that risk is, we're looking to analyze um, internal information within the organization. Um, so you'll recall I, I spoke about um, enterprise integration. So once we can integrate that, then we can start to analyze that information and look for anomalies. Not necessarily that that indicates a threat, but we can then flag that to um, security and that will then trigger um, uh, uh, further investigations. So those are the kinds of levels of things that we're doing. But, um, you know, uh, technology is not going to fix this. Um, we have a serious problem with um, our um, values in relation to ethics, et cetera, um, in South Africa. And so we can't fix a values problem with a process or with technology. We have to fix it um, at a values level. Um, so I think the, the solution to this problem is, is not going to be a quick one. Um, but we have, um, from a um, uh, organizational process, uh, operational concept point of view, been looking at how we deal with that. Um, and there's certainly some things we can do with technology, but technology is not going to fix everything. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. I hope that answers your question. I think this is also um, what we also need to note here, which is important, is that this is one of the examples of moving away from a compliance method where compliance would have said that you need to do a vetting of a person before you employ him. And now we say you need to do uh, integrity management, which is a continuous process of, of vetting the person while he's still working in, 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 in order to actually um, deal with that risk. 
Well, all your um, questions answered. Sorry, I think just one more thing right. um, on that. Um, the way you do access control, um, I didn't have time to get into it now, but um, there's further measures in terms of restricting access um, based on um, a um, access um, governance model that we've been working on as well. So people who don't need to have access to particularly sensitive areas can then also be excluded on the basis of um, their um, clearance or competence. So remember, um, with SEPA, one of the important aspects that constitute a threat is not just um, you know um, malicious or criminal activity, but um, accidents that could cause the infrastructure to not be available. So, and accidents happen because people enter areas um, and they are not aware of the dangers um, or, or the risks of that particular area. So the access model then looks both at um, a security clearance and also a competence. Are you, um, have you in, um, been through the uh, safety induction video? Um, are you cleared from a training point of view? Uh, do you have the required medical certificates, et cetera, as may be required, for example, in the nuclear industry? So um, that's the full extent of um, you know, how we're dealing with that. Again, that's not a full solution to the corruption problem, but um, restricting access of people that don't need to be in particularly sensitive areas, again, um, helps to um, reduce some of the risks. So I thought I'd just mention that. Um, again, not directly related, but again, it can contribute to um, securing um, some, um, some sites. Including linking to national databases, like for instance, the uh, wanted persons database. That will help you not to provide access to people that are already wanted. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, there at the back, to the left hand side, my left hand side. Yes? Um, that's an excellent question. So um, I can't comment as to exactly when the regulations will be released. Um, I do know that um, uh, one of the challenges um, is that SAPS is a little bit short-staffed in this particular area, but they are working on it. I'm hoping that um, in the coming year, um, those regulations will be released. Um, in terms of what to do, um, there's a couple of things. Um, so the first thing is to familiarize yourself with the Act. Um, and the Act uh, requires that you have a security policy and a security plan. Um, uh, and, and we're working on actually defining what those things are. But um, if you're looking for some further advice on um, you know, how to meet the requirements um, you know, and how to do the, um, you know, how to be, go through the process of designation, um, you're welcome to contact me. Um, I can give you some further information. Um, we've got a lot more insight um, than I've been able to present here, but um, we, we've been working very closely with a regulator to do this. Okay, I was just now told that we can carry on till three o'clock. So that gives us another 10 minutes if there are more still questions. other questions, but we don't need to carry on until three o'clock. <laughs> So, uh, are there any other questions? Okay, then uh, let me just finally say, say thank you very much to Duarte and Andre for very informative uh, uh, presentations that you did. And thank you to all of you for, for being here and listening to we, what we've got to tell you. Thank you very much.